The last session is entitled Fostering um, Contributions to Standardization in RNI Activities. And I would like to start by introducing the moderator, Sinja Annette Bok. And she is a senior management, uh, project manager for research and innovation in st Danish standards. Welcome. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, as mentioned, this is a session about fostering contributions to standardization in research and innovation activities. My name is Sina, and it is on. Closer? Better? All right. So, as mentioned, my name is Sina Netbø. I'm a senior project manager at Danish Standards. And for more than a decade, I have been involved in national and European research innovation activities featuring standardization. And the latest project that I'm involved in is that I am a partner in a project called hsbooster.eu, which aims to link research innovation and standardization and help Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe projects in reaching their standardization potential. So you can imagine that the discussion we're going to have today is a topic that's quite close to my heart personally. So standardization, what is this actually about? Standardization is about valorization. It's about uptake of research and innovation results. It's about making sure there's interoperability between elements and innovations. And I was just thinking during the previous session that standardization is also a lot about terminology because we're talking about these codes of practices, but they're actually not the same. The code of practice we were talking about in the earlier session is the code of practice for intellectual property. And now we're going to talk about another code of practice, which about standardization in the European research innovation area. So standardization can also help in research in figuring out what are the terms we're actually discussing, which can be quite key. So we all know that we're discussing the same thing when we're having these discussions. And finally, of course, standardization is also about market uptake and making sure all these wonderful innovations that we get actually reach the market. This is also one of the reasons why research and innovation is a key part of the European standardization strategy, which was launched last year. However, even though there is a lot of focus on standardization these days, there still are some issues because researchers, spin-offs, and startups, as it is now, often do not consider standardization as a priority. Often they do not see the benefits of standardization. They do not have the necessary resources to participate in standardization. Or maybe they even consider that the time spent on standardization is not sufficiently rewarded. So there really is a need for a consistent approach to facilitate this link between research innovation and standardization, and also raise strategic awareness of the benefits of standardization for research and innovation. The commission has already launched a few key initiatives. As mentioned, standardization also has a code of practice. This code of practice is called standardization, or oh sorry, code of practice on standardization in the European research area. It can be Googled if you would like to read it. This code gives recommendations on how to strengthen this link between research, innovation, and standardization. It gives a set of recommendations that are aimed at higher education institutions, public-private research organizations, project partners, also policy and other key stakeholders. So almost regardless of your background, then this code will be interesting for you. Secondly, there's another initiative launched by the Commission, which is the standardization booster called hsbooster.eu. This Horizon booster supports Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe projects in reaching their standardization potential, testing the relevance of their results for standardization. It provides training material We've already today been discussing that there needs to be more skills out there. So that's also something that's provided by HS Booster. We also have some dedicated and free of charge services 
for European projects that they can apply for, where they are linked with experts within their field to get help with reaching the benefits of standardization for their particular innovations and projects. And today, we are very fortunate because as you see, we have a very large panel today of some key experts exchanging views on how we can better create this link. But before I start introducing the speakers, I just want to remind you all that you can ask questions via Slido. And we will also open the floor for questions from the panel, or sorry, not for the panel, for the audience after mm -hmm. these questions here. So it's my honor to now start presenting the panelists. So first up, over here, we have Livia Mian. Livia is a project manager for Sen and Senelec's innovation team. For those of you who do not know Sen and Senelec, they are two of the European standardization organizations. Here she's responsible for various activities relating to research, innovation, and standardization. And this includes, for example, providing secretarial support to a key working group on standardization research innovation called STAIR, which is hosted by Sen and Senelec, and also focusing on how can we increase market uptake of project results via standardization. Next to Livia, we have Mr. Fernando Trilla. He has been with the Spanish national standard body UNE since 2001. And since 2012, he's been the head of research and innovation department in UNE. This also includes providing training and creating awareness on what is the role of standardization in the innovation life cycle. Fernando has been in more than 100 funded European projects. So I can, with a lot of confidence, say that Fernando is one of the main forces in Europe in linking research, innovation, and standardization. Here we then have Mr. David Boswatek. He is the director of new technologies in Etsy, which is the third of the European standardization organizations. This involves, for example, tracking the latest ICT technologies, trends, and research initiatives mm -hmm. to make sure that standards follow this progress that we identify appropriate standardization needs and future opportunities. This also includes outreach activities toward the academic and research stakeholders, as well as engaging with key uh, frameworks such as Horizon Europe. And with more than 30 years of experience in the telecommunication sector, whereof 20 have been working with ICT standardization, and for example, 3DPP, and also working with technical and strategic groups. Then I think we have another key panelist here with a lot of good experience that we'll be sharing a little later. Moving on. Then we have Professor Dimitrios Gouretis. He's Professor Emeritus of ICT of Sustainable Manufacturing at the École Politique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. He's also a senior advisor of, in the Department of Informatics in the University of Oslo. He is the co-founder of the Industrial Ontologies Foundry. And since 2019, he's also been actively involved in the World Economic Forum platform on advanced manufacturing and supply chains. In regard to research, his research interests have involved mostly closed loop life cycle management, sustainable manufacturing, cognitive digital twins, and industrial ontologies. And with more than 250 publications, I think we can really say that Dimitrios is an expert within this field. And then finally, we have Ms. Brante Stumpf. She has been with the Romanian Standardization Association since 2003, where, for example, she's been working on developing the different standardization activities in what is called ASRO, the Romanian Standardization Organization. And since 2014, she's also been responsible for project management and training activities, which includes awareness raising for the research and innovation community on the benefits of standardization for research. And finally, Speranta is also on the advisory board for agesbooster.eu, 
So here we also have another key export. So this is the panel, and we are going to jump straight into the questions. And as mentioned, you will also, as the audience, be able to ask questions later on. So the first question I'm going to direct toward Dimitrios. In your experience, what are key standardization activities to consider in research and innovation projects? And how can we assure that projects are aware of the benefits of linking with standardization? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Shin, and uh, thank you for the introduction. By the way, today is my name day, so it's Dimitrios in, in Greek. So, And um, what I would like to say about standardization, I'm a researcher, so I did all past 30 years research in the university. For me, standardization is um, a consolidation of IP created somehow by various stakeholders. And at the universities, we create IP by fundamental or applied research. I, I mainly did applied research in various um, collaborative projects funded by the European Commission, man, many of them. Uh, today, I would like to, to talk to you a little bit about my experience in two of them recent ones, so there were some experience for other ones, but it was, these ones are more concrete. So one of them was in name, uh, Horizon 2020, Quality is it the name of my participant to that project. It was a, about a zero defect manufacturing. It was not the only one on this topic, there were other two, and um, DJ Prime and Z, Z PM. And together, so there were a kind of cluster. And uh, with, uh, I don't remember the initiative, I think it was a personal conduct of some of one project with some people in standardizations. So the SEN, so the uh, SEN Senelec, um, created a workshop. Um, and uh, the topic, so the subject was terminology on zero defect manufacturing. So we, w we had weekly workshops and uh, at the end, towards the end of the projects or near after, we arrived to a kind of pre-standard as I can <coughs> qualify it, um, CWA, SEN Workshop Agreement 17918. So which is a document, it's available, it's concrete, and it's already used as far as I know. Terminology says number of terms identified. So how this will continue? So I do not know yet. I can imagine it in my field that based on this vocabulary, this terminology, we could create an ontology that could be used in practical applications and then, then it would become a standard. So about how um, benefits, how we can go from university to standardization processes, I would like to talk to you about my other um, experience, another project, it is a CSA called Auto Commons. It's about um, created um, odology-based standards for technical documentation. Um, very interesting, so it's just about to finish, so we will have the final review in a couple of weeks from now here in Brussels. And there it is about standards, and we had contacts about various communities and groups uh, and I'm very towards the end of the project, a couple of months ago, so we have been approached by another European project on standards, HS Booster. Maybe some, some of you know about that. So I personally had an interview, a communication with one of their experts. And we have six bullet points, if I can name them. So what to, to pay attention when starting thinking about standards. First is define standardization goals. I mean, as a researcher, so what, how we should think. Define which are the goals of the standardization activities. Timing is important. Why now? Why we have to start now about a specific standard? Then about the um, maintenance, or sometimes in my experience, it was a kind of stag stagnation of this process because we had that standardization activities in many projects, but almost nothing was delivered concretely at, at the end. So why this standard should be supported and uh, if it becomes out of date quickly, etc. Then comprehension, comprehend why, why, 
why we do need to do this. So this comes from various interactions, I think. And then who will do this work? So who will be responsible about that and why? How we will be motivated? Harmonizing, so see what happens in other groups. This was the experience in the previous projects when we had three projects working together on the same project. And then scope, identify well what are the important aspects. Again, in the example of the zero defect manufacturing projects, so the scope was the vocabulary, the terminology, the first level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mises. I think this really goes into some of the key elements is first of all, projects should consider developing a standardization strategy, not only to define what they should do in regards to standardization, but also to define if something should be done or not. But at least it should be considered when working in research innovation and preferably from an early stage. Because that only also leads to, for example, being able to make concrete deliverables, such as the SIN workshop agreement uh, that you made in one of your projects. So, second question for you, Speranza. How can standardization developing organizations and national standard bodies develop their service portfolio of research innovation actors? And this includes technology transfer officers and examine new ways to align activities with research innovation. Thank you, Sinia. Of course, there are several ways. ASRO had a great opportunity to be part of Brigitte 1 and Brigitte 2 projects, and we learn a lot, including what standardization can do for research and innovation actors and the best way to do it. Um, best practices are very important for any organization and for the NSBs too. However, this way uh, is in theory. There is a gap between theory and practice, and to bridge this gap, we uh, started step by step. From the intention, uh, from making the intention to participate uh, in research and innovation projects, which take into consideration standardization activities publicly, to using the European Commission uh, authentication system application. My colleague and I probably, we must have sent hundreds of emails to relevant consortiums. Of course, every beginning is difficult. We participated in the first years in more than uh, 30 projects proposal on Horizon 2020 and one in just one. It's a lot of work with poor results, but we did not get discouraged and continue to identify research and innovation projects and partners and consortiums willing to include standardization in their results. Now, ASRO is involved in um, over 10 projects in research and innovation area, mostly of them at uh, European level. Uh, it is not much for a big NSBs, but ASRO is a small one, has as few as 55 employees, and I think it is good for now. We still have a lot of work inside and outside, especially with our own colleagues. Some of them are uh, trying to overcome their fear of participating in research and innovation project. We are not researchers, we are standardization experts. But already some of my colleagues um, broke the ice and started to participate in research and innovation project, and they are pleased with that. So that is from ASRO experience. Thank you very much, Puanta. I think that's also very interesting to know that this is actually a learning experience from all of us, that we have to learn how to engage in the best way as a benefit for all of us. And that leads me to my third question, which is for Livia, in how can we optimize the synchronization of project life cycle and standardization life cycle 
Which methods are already in place and how can they be improved? Thank you, Senior. Yes, part of this mismatch issue comes from the fact that often research projects do not plan for standardization activities upfront uh, at the beginning of their project and when drafting the proposal. And need for standardization may arise while the project is running or even when the project is finished and its results are delivered. But at that stage, resources and time to tackle standardization needs may be lacking. So what we are doing as a standard body is to offer pre-standardization solutions that are designed to better meet the need of speed coming from research and innovation. At European level, we offer the San Sanlec Workshop Agreement, in short CWA, which was mentioned by Dimitris, which is a pre-standard that is quite attractive for research projects that need to deliver results within the project lifetime and that can be used as a stepping stone for the development of future European standards. On the other hand, what research consortia should do is try to make sure that the results that they deliver that can be relevant for future standardization will be followed up when the project is over as part of an exploitation strategy. And they can do so by promoting the interests of technical committees in the results that have been delivered, but also by uh, linking with follow-up funded projects that will have similar scope or common partners and that can continue working <coughs> on that standardization activities. And of course, researchers that are partners in research projects can consider becoming involved in standardization on a more permanent basis, even beyond the, the duration of one single project. And finally, a last category of stakeholder that is crucial in promoting a better synchronization between project life cycle and standardization life cycle are policymakers uh, in charge of public research funding because they can, on one hand, make sure that standardization is mentioned when relevant in the call for proposal to avoid the risk that standardization activity gets overlooked when the proposal is drafted. And they can also put in place follow-up funding mechanisms that give resources to those projects that are finished and delivered results that can be relevant for standardization. That's the spirit of the HS Booster project. And I think similar schemes should be continued in the future, perhaps even explored at national or regional level. So overall, I think uh, solution and option are already in place. The important thing is that research projects are aware of what are the options and that best practices are promoted as source of inspiration. And if you will follow the event this afternoon, there will be our Standard Plus Innovation Award Ceremony, which is going to give you plenty of example of uh, best practices. Thank you very much, Livia. <coughs> this again stresses the importance of considering standardization already at the proposal stage uh, to see if the project can somehow benefit from linking with standardization because some mechanisms are in place uh, that support getting standardization uh, linked closer with research innovation projects. So, David, this one is for you. In the case then that there are some research innovation projects out there locally that are considering standardization and doing some concrete standardization activities, but then the project ends. So how do we ensure that these innovative contributions to standardization are not lost and how do we consider that there should be a handover from research to industry? Thank you, Sim. Um, yes, um, it's a difficult situation that research typically lasts for three to four years. Project will be set up, there'll be consortia. They may consider standardization from day zero, as Olivia said. We recommend that any group of companies and universities setting up uh, a project actually think about a standardization strategy. I like that word. We tend to say roadmap, but a, a strategy. Does the technology you wish to research need standardization? If so, where, when, and, and how? Um, this is something that we try to do with research projects. We actually offer them standardization advice. So when groups of consortia are setting up projects, we say, would you like us to be on your steering committee, on your advisory committee? And then we can talk to you about, if it's a 5G, 6G technology, you need to talk to 3GBP, uh, ORAN, EDSI, and others. M often they don't have the knowledge. And I know there's many researchers in the room um, and the priorities for standards engineers and researchers are completely different. So what we have to do as standards bodies, we need to understand what are your priorities. And for the past three or four years, we've put in place tools and enablers to help researchers. 
the results are good, but they're not perfect. And I talked to a number of universities in Portugal, in Spain, and in Italy, and I said, what is, what is stopping you from getting involved in standards? And the main answer that came back was, you don't understand what we need. You don't understand what is important. What are, are the research KPIs? You're looking at standardization KPIs. So we did a couple of years ago a survey to all of our 150 research academic members, and they identified a number of barriers. And they're very simple, and I've heard them said a, a few times already. One is funding and accessibility. Uh, the money to go to standards meetings and the ability to go to standards meetings. This has been met to a certain extent by Stand ICT, HS Booster, the European Commission have put in place tools and enablers to help things move forward. So the barrier of funding has, is being removed. It's not fully gone. Um, recognition. Why would a researcher working on a very technical topic spend two, three, four years trying to get a concept into 3GPP SA4 or 3GPP SA5. It's really hard and complex. Um, so we need to work on the value of standardization. How can making that effort on standardization help you get impact? We heard about patents and IPRs, that's one element. Recognition, that's another element. And career, uh, furthering people's careers as well. We've seen many researchers then move on into senior standardization and development management through their experience in standards. So in response to the question, I've gone off target a little bit, I would say the important element is to look at the longer game. Don't say the project lasts for three years. From day zero, you, you need to say we're going to research in this area. It links into the, these other areas, which is why roadmaps such as the uh, SNSJU, we have a number of projects working together. Each project needs to look at the other projects and see where there are um, harmonies and, 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 and relationships and then work at life after the project and this I think then goes back to the regulators as well if a regulator actually has a standardization a standardization policy and funds projects I think the European Commission can actually say to the projects what have you done in standardization have you met this KPI and this we didn't see really in horizon 2020 we're seeing it more in horizon Europe that the Commission is actually saying to the funded projects what have you, you achieved halfway through you through what will you have achieved at the end of the project? And that's actually a KPI for value, value added. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> I think this really also shows that um, standardization can be key, uh, that can also supplement in regard to intellectual property rights, intellectual property, because sometimes if you need an innovation to go to market, it's not necessarily go to market just because you have IPR on it. Uh, sometimes you need more, for example, building trust in the innovation, and this is something that standardization can help with. So, Livia, another question for you. Uh, how do we ensure the standardization and the standardization community also includes innovative policies <coughs> and doesn't only standardize for research? Well, uh, I think the importance of foresight was mentioned in the opening remark this morning by Joanna Drake. And I think indeed foresight type of activities are crucial for us to look ahead and anticipate future technology trends that will be relevant for developing standards in new and innovative areas. A successful example of foresight on standardization is the putting science into standard initiative that we in San Sanac have co-developed with the Joint Research Center, which is the in-house scientific service of the European Commission which is precisely meant to identify early on new areas of possible standardization and encourage early discussion between research innovation and standardization community to define future priorities. Thanks to this initiative, uh, in recent years, we have successfully brought into the standardization system novel technologies such as quantum technologies and organ on chip with the creation of new groups within SANSANLAC responsible for standardization activities in this area. I think being connected to research projects is also an excellent opportunity for a standardization body to become exposed to innovative areas and new technologies and shape future standardization early on. We are very pleased that the European standardization strategy published last year is recognizing the importance of tapping into the knowledge of research projects and facilitating a process of transferring knowledge from research results into new standards. And the code of practice is filling an important gap by making clearer uh, in practical terms how this knowledge transfer process can be facilitated. 
So we've also been discussing a little bit uh, about uh, what are the incentives for research innovation projects to actually get involved in standardization. So I would like to address my next question to Fernando. Do you think that standardization is covered sufficiently in European funding schemes? And if not, how can this be addressed? Well, uh, thank you, Simon. Um, well, in our experience, uh, as you mentioned before, we have uh, taken part in more than 100 projects since uh, FP7, starting in FP7. And this means that we have uh, helped uh, more than 100 uh, project consortia to <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to approach a standardization and to get uh, a real contribution to the standardization, like create new standards, create new working groups in standardization committees to revise existing standards, etc. No, a lot of interesting uh, contributions to standardization, interesting for them and interesting for uh, the industry and interesting for for Europe. This is. We are talking about specific uh, contributions for researchers to to, to to standardization, but we be, we if we open a bit the, the focus, uh, we are talking about the position of Europe in the in the forefront of technology, and this is the the, the real uh, message of all of this. No, so uh, in our experience, um, in we have been increasing our participation in during Horizon 2020. And we can take this as a, as a sample of, of the, the contribution to standardization from the, 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 the total of, of projects. Uh, but in Horizon Europe, we are being decreasing this participation. We have been invited to take part in less projects. And this is a bit, uh, a, a bit of a, a, a paradox because now we have the, the um, the, the code of practice, which is a very good uh, tool with a very good bunch of recommendations. Uh, we got the standardization booster, which is helping a lot of projects. So why this can be, be happening? I think this, these kind of activities are uh, uh, like <laughs> a simple comparison, are like the key to unlock a door but if we want this door fully open and with a lot of traffic across, uh, we need to push this door to be open, okay? So, um, and this passing shall be uh, with a combination of uh, long-term and shorter-term uh, measures. The longer term, well, uh, there can be um, to create strategies in organizations about the standardization to, to um, promote the recognition of uh, standardization in researchers. But in the shorter term, we must increase this visibility of uh, standardization in their requirements of Horizon Europe. Because, simply because um, the competition in Horizon Europe is very high, you know. And the applicants to, the, to, the, to these calls are mm, usually sticking to the requirements that appears in the call because they, they, their first aim is to, uh, to pass the, the evaluation. You know? So it is very important to increase this uh, number of references to standardization because this will open this door and maybe in some days we will create this momentum and, and then researchers can be more aware of the benefits of a standardization and can use it. But at the beginning we need to push them a bit. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, as in the previous session, we are running a little bit low on time. So Speranza, could I ask for a, a short answer? Did the Romanian Standardization Association develop their research innovation policy? And how can we ensure that national standard bodies also are adapted to support research innovation in the future? Thank you, Simia. As I said uh, in my first answer, ASRO was favored, taking in consideration the participation in uh, Brigitte 2 project, where uh, we learn a lot on how to um, approach the research and innovation uh, community, how to develop our own work as an NSB in order to 
uh, makes uh, our future activities more competitive for research and innovation area. Our beginning was slow, cautious. We started with participation in uh, one project and with an employee working part-time on project dedicated to research and innovation area. Now, uh, in ASTRO, it's a specific unit with two um, dedicated employees only for research and innovation projects. We are involved in several projects from different programs like uh, Horizon Europe, Life Plus, Erasmus Plus projects, and some other projects at uh, national levels. Our cooperation with research and innovation partners uh, is neither a wish or an accident, it's a reality. An important landmark on our uh, strategy for the next 10 years. And we work on this day by day, fostering cooperation with national researchers and European researchers too. As a, most, a small NSB, experts from ASRO must work harder on that uh, searching for new collaboration, um, searching for new projects in research and innovation area, demonstrating that we are a valuable partners that we could bring and should bring uh, added value through the standardization activities, which we'll, we will implement in specific area of the project. And I think we done a good job so far, if I may so by myself, because we have become uh, thought after for new proposal by consortia we've already worked with, uh, which provide that the quality of our uh, work was most than satisfactory. Thank you very much, Branza. As you can hear, this is very much also about cooperation. And now we've heard from the standard body side, I would like to ask Demetrius a similar question. What do you think research innovation institutions need to develop a standardization policy and achieve this long-term new culture for using standardization as valorization? So let me start with a short anecdote. So years ago, um, my team in a project uh, were in, invited to participate on a ISO working group. And when we tried to do so, we learned that we had to go through the National Association of Standardization in Switzerland. And this um, took time because my university was not affiliated to that. And then I was not allowed to pay for myself the contribution. Then somehow it, it, took, it took time. Um, so it was not easy. So my idea so is, um, would be to facilitate participation of research, researchers to ISO standardization bodies by a simple action. So research at institutions and universities become members of their ISO st structure so easily. It was not too much. It was 900 Swiss francs per year. So it would, I could pay it from my team or my, my project, but it was not so easy to do so. Um, it, it is easier for universities to be involved in other standardization bodies like uh, OASIS, OAGI, the, the, the Open Group, etc. And we learn that from a reviewer of our project. So he was a German man, pushed us to, to, to associate with one of the bodies and it, it worked somehow. Um, <coughs> then the contribution to standards of an academic researcher is not recognized in the career in the evaluation plan. So contribution to patents is contribution to new, new knowledge and it, it, it counts. But contribution to standards is not somehow contribution to new knowledge as consolidation and it doesn't count. Uh, my suggestion would be that this counts. So as we write sometimes book chapters in universities, not research papers, but book chapters that consolidate our work at least contribution of researchers to standards could be considered 
as, um, uh, as this kind of contribution. And one thing that happens recently, but it was not uh, existed in the past, is that standardization bodies and organization SDOs, like the ones that are present here, so to, to create practical guides for standards development, for researchers, etc. now we have this kind of practice. So David said that make a plan from the day zero, etc. But uh, I do not know how to do it. So I need some somebody to tell me how to do it. So I'm, and it, this is not my main motivation to create standards in universities. I, I would need, no, I, so my community is, would need support. Thank you very much. So oh, we're. So initiatives like H S Booster. Booster. H S Booster. 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 Yes. Booster. 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 I think the, the European approach and, and Horizon Europe is fundamental for this, um, for, for research in Europe, but also the national uh, the programs are, are influencing a lot the, the, the careers of the, the researchers and so on. No? So it's very important that the uh, national governments uh, don't forget to include the standardization in the consideration of the standardization in their programs, in their laws, in their national plans about um, transfer, about uh, um, yeah, about industry, about research, um, and more practically, um, well, um, more practically, uh, in they can. Um, also, uh, do two things. So the, the first one, this consideration in, in the legislation and so on, and the second one, to provide example with practice. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, public uh, universities, public research institutions, so they should be the first ones in implementing this kind of uh, strategies, so this kind of uh, consideration of the transfer offices about standardization. And this way we can uh, promote it as well to the to the private sector, no? And well, um, many times they don't know how to do it, but uh, they are not alone. In, in every country there is a standardization body, a national standardization body, and we can help them to 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 support this kind of strategies and so on. So they can use us because they are we are and the standardization bodies are there to to help in this kind of. Thank you very much, Fernando. I think we've had a lot of uh, really insight into what is going on right now. A lot has been done already. A lot is still to be done. So I think now we will open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, citizens and uh, scientists. Uh, my name is Angelos Karlaftis, EVAPOS advisor. When I came here in uh, Brussels 17 years ago, it was to research this project, uh, Europe Cold, how it can be related with the citizens and the societies of Europe. After 17 years, I'm asking you, the experts in standards, how we can uh, relate the work of the researchers in the standard uh, uh, phase uh, to, uh, to the citizens, because we haven't answered and we haven't put at all the title of, the, of our today event for which we are here. In order to assist a little bit our proposal of the Echo Waves movement, which I represent here, the scientific team of it, uh, which is based in dark democracy, in science and in ecology, which is bringing a new vision to European citizens, um, is um, uh, how this can, uh, it's our concern also, how this can be implemented to the citizens' assemblies in educational level. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's a very interesting question, not an easy one to answer. Um, we need to be careful not to just do technology for the sake of technology. This is what we're always looking at in Etsy. Um, 
we have a technology roadmap which says these are the big technologies of the next uh, three to five years. On there, you'll find lots of buzzwords, you blockchain, uh, AI, um, 6G, whatever you like, everything is there. But seen from the user's perspective, um, these can be quite frightening. We saw in 5G, many people were worried about radiation levels from millimeter wave and such things like that. So if we just do a technology for the sake of technology ap approach, it will not succeed. It may not fail, fail, but it will not succeed. So what we're encouraging all of our groups to do and all of the projects that we work with to do is have an education and outreach element. So if you're working on um, something for the metaverse, see is it actually needed. It's a wonderful technology. It may make money, but is it actually needed or is it just a, a technology for the sake of technology? So whereas in, let's, in Etsy's terminology, 5G was a good network, but it wasn't well explained. What we're looking at now for 6G is that we actually explain to the user communities how it will help them. And 6G will be much more socially um, relevant, more based on sustainability, on green, on helping communities, on global outreach. So just in the ICT area, this is already being addressed. But the big thing is outreach communication early on in the process. Thank you very much, David. I think, again, since we are a little low on time, I'm just going to quickly take one of the ones uh, that we have from the Q&A from Slido. In regard to at what point uh, can projects apply to the Rise and Sanitation Booster, which is called agesbooster.eu. And I would say this can be done at any time in the project because you are able to apply more than once and it's free of charge. So I definitely would encourage people to apply both early on but also at a later stage because you can get different knowledge at that time. So maybe just uh, if we have any final questions. Yes, I have something. Yeah. So uh, I, I agree with that, what uh, Sunja said. And I would like to, to add to my experience that most of the results, even if you go to Horizon Research Booster or not, or Stad ICT, will be, um, let's say, available towards the end or after the end of the project as project results. So for researchers or uh, industrial um, participants, so they, they will be somehow, let's say, stayed in the files for a long, a good period of time. So my idea was the SDOs that are present here and others, they have a tool to scan these project results that are available now and with a tool or somehow identify the most mature ones and then create or invite the stakeholders in a kind of standardization process. Um, this may, may help uh, to, to use some of this better. Thank you. I think this is also a, a good recommendation in regard to, for example, creating some cooperation between the standardization bodies and the European Commission in finding out where are the elements that we really need to standardize right now uh, so we can link them with the relevant research innovation projects. So I think that uh, concludes the Q&A. We have just a short final statement for every one of the participants that should be on the board in any second. So, we have here some of the final, um, there we are, it's going, yeah, sorry, the mouse is a little bit fast today. <laughs> but anyway, we have a couple of last remarks. Uh, in regard to what would these panelists like for the audience today to take with them from this session in regard to standardization and innovation. So I think we will start with Dimitrios. Yes, I think you can read them both. Ah, so also you can read, so I said that in, in, my, in my interventions. So recognize uh, work of researchers in their universities in standardizations as contribution to practice. So that we have contribution to knowledge, and then this could be also considered as contribution to practice. And the other thing is what I have already said. So SDO, SDOs to help scan the results mainly after the end of the project, so to identify what is mature to go through the standardization process. Thank you. Handing over to Fernando. Yes, well, um, I think that Europe needs this standardization in, in research to be competitive. Um, but we must do a lot of effort still because we don't have this culture uh, of linking research and innovation. So we, get, we need to promote it a lot. 
Esperanza. Yes, sometimes it's a big step from standard taker to standard maker with a very fine line between them. Depending on the research and innovation actors, but also depends on the standardization experts to reach the finish line. If we do it together, standardization and uh, researchers, we will have the opportunity to contribute to one of the best tools to turn the research outcomes to good account. Livia? Yes, my final message is that standards are a tool to promote lasting value out of research results, as well as to facilitate their market uptake. And therefore, it's important that researchers are encouraged to bring forward their scientific results and innovative ideas for the development of new standards. And this includes making sure that their contribution is recognized and also that it matters for the development of their career progression. And finally, David. Thank you. Um, much has been said, but I would just like to emphasize education. Um, so we really need to educate researchers uh, and students, even at, at a young age, on the importance of standardization, the value of standardization. We need to explain how it can be useful and bring value to them, and this needs to be done at the earliest age. And we've, we've done education about standardization books and modules, but it's no good having these books if they're not updated and taken out to the students. We need to actually have an engaging process where we educate, we listen, we hear the pain points that researchers may have, and then we alleviate those pain points. So engage early, educate, and listen to researchers to make sure that standardization fits. Thank you very much to all the panelists.